Hello. Welcome, Infused listeners. Welcome to another edition of Infused. Now, Infused again is brought to you by Alias Can. And Alias Can, we have this, our motto, no one grows alone. We're growing. Our listener base is growing. So we want to start off by saying thank you. Thank you for listening to our podcast and joining in and following us on social. We certainly appreciate it. I appreciate it. Francesca's here with me today. Welcome, Francesca. Thank you, guys. Hi. I'm so grateful to everybody who's tuned in and is tuning in and is sharing about tuning in and tuning more people in. All the tuning is good. Absolutely. People turning on their friends uh, and colleagues to us, and and we couldn't be more grateful to you guys. Francesca, I have a question for you. Go for it. Um, What do you think of that interstate, that that I-95 that we take all the way down here to the Alias Can Studios? It's um, rather important to have Mm -hmm. that be accessible and clear. And unfortunately, if I know where you're going, that's not going to be the case much longer because we're looking at some major construction that I am You don't enjoy the construction? I I know orange cones Uh, are like, or orange barrels are like Delaware's, I don't know, We keep those orange barrel guys in in business, don't (laughs) we? Yeah. I'll tell you what they are uh, is convenient. Um, and the new, <laughs> the new plans when I was looking at them, if you're familiar with the mousetrap game, you're going to slow down right outside of Newport. You're going to wait for an old man to jump into a bathtub. And once he does, you're good to go. You're, well, you're, good, to, you're good to go to at least Newark. And uh, our Jersey listeners are going to wonder what the hell I'm thinking. Yeah, Newark, but it's insane. Newark. I mean, we're having this major construction. It's going to be a, a little bit of a shit show for sure. Well, you know, I was thinking about it and I was thinking about the ve- one day very soon with all the legislation and growth that's going on. 95 is literally going to be a corridor of cannabis options. Once yes. the Great Garden State gets going, hi, Hetty, New Jersey. I, I read your emails. <laughs> I read your emails every time you send them. Um, it's going to be a, a really interesting thing when you can be in Maryland, go to a dispensary there, maybe hop on up the Garden State Expressway and then sample uh, the, the, the grows of some, of some amazing farmers in the Garden State. Not just but, tomatoes anymore. No, no. And those people know how to grow. We can't wait for them to enter this game. Um, it made me think, with the new year, I got some interesting stats for you to begin our little discussion today. Um, we have 55 million people that, that use cannabis now in this country, admittedly, that openly. And, and think about 55 million when there's 59 million cigarette smokers. That's, mm. that's amazing. More than half are parents. God bless you. It's about time. You, you need your- They deserve it. You need your little time out, don't you? 35 million regular users. So my point is people are getting more and more used to uh, cannabis as a new normal. Again, we've used that phrase before. And uh, one thing that I, I, I don't know if a lot of uh, non-cannabis people who are, you know, have, have any familiarity with is the trip to a dispensary. So I wanted to ask you your first expression, or excuse me, first experience as an East Coaster. When was your first uh, trip to a dispensary? Do you, do you remember where you were? Do you remember who you were with? Dates um, and years and calendars are not really my strong point to know. I don't, I don't remember when. It was a few <laughs> years ago, but um, it, was, it, was right, it was right around when cannabis became um, recreationally legal in, in California. And I was out there okay. and went into a dispensary there for my first time. And I had no idea what I was doing. So it was just, it was very tight. It was very controlled. It was very new for everybody, not just me or maybe not everybody, but majority of people. Were there things falling in the dispensary? Things are falling things like that? apart a little bit. Like you're in the Muppet show. <laughs> um, so, but it was just, it was not, it wasn't like the warmest experience. It wasn't the worst experience. It was a different experience than anything I've ever had of being guided into a store, of having a waiting room before you're in the store, of having your ID checked and rechecked and then getting kind of put in line. And I felt a little bit of a time crunch because I knew other people were waiting. So it was a mixed bag, but it was, it was cleaner and more sophisticated and well run than I expected. But it was also um, a little more nerve wracking the first time. Since wow. then, it's been a lot better. Yeah. Do you remember what you were after? What product in particular? Probably gummies, if I know me. Inedible. Yeah. Yeah. I um, love it. I like that you brought up that it was kind of challenged your, your expectations, right? Uh, you're not used to being led into a place uh, and sort of guided uh, to, towards the, the selection you want to make. I, I think the, the whole inner workings of, of dispensaries is, is I don't know, it's, it's fascinating to me because so many people don't know what it's like to go in there. And there's um, no one experience. There's right. a number of dispensaries are run a number of different ways. 
Yeah. Yeah. You have a, a very, I, I don't know, I don't, the very like clean, uh, static kind of um, approach that some of these places have where it looks almost like a Mac store, you know, mm-hmm. and you have a lot of things behind glass. Or you have like a Lodo Health and Wellness, my favorite out in, in, in Denver that, that was, it was like going and visiting friends, right? It was like almost going into their, their basement and, hey, what are, what are you looking for? What, what, what mood are you in? Where are you going? Um, it's interesting. So I, I thought today would be a really cool day to, uh, we'll go back to that I-95 thing. Let's go south. Let's go south. And I want to bring a guy in. Um, he's a, a person that we've come to know and work with for a bit. Um, uh, Chase. Chase, I'd like you to join us today. You're welcome to Infused. You're our first guest. Thank you so hey. much. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate we, it. We really appreciate you being here, Chase. Now, um, we said that we worked with you. We're going to get to that in, in a little bit. But uh, you're joining us down from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, but that's not, that's not where you, you come from. Tell us a little bit of how you got into the cannabis game. So, a uh, brief history on myself is I'm actually a Denver import. So, I was... Born in Colorado, grew up there for a little bit. Um, After, you know, graduating junior high and high school, um, got into the can or in college, got into the cannabis game. I started in a cannabis game about 2009, I think was my entry point. Um, That was when I first got, I actually got my first card back in 2008. If you get a medical card. Back when it cost, yeah, about $350 to get the card. Wow. Right. So, uh, wow. Kind of how far we've come from then. But I started in the industry in 2010 as a bud tender, uh, worked my way up the ranks, um, started managing a dispensary in 2012, uh, managed that dispensary uh, for about five, four or five years, and then was recruited to come out to Baltimore um, from our president and CEO, Mackie Barch, uh, to run the dispensary out here. So it's kind of my journey there. So I've been in the game for about 10, 11 years now, something like that. So Wow, you and that—that that is a veteran in the cannabis yeah. business. It's almost like measuring things in dog years. You say we've got <laughs> ten years in this industry. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I don't—I don't think there's any medals of valor in this industry, but uh, you know, I will—I'll uh, take the vet label. Uh, yeah, definitely for sure. <laughs> certainly, certainly. I, I love that that uh, you're sharing that you you started out as a bud tender. Was that was that work that you were you know that you took to pretty pretty naturally or? So, yeah, um, for the most part, when I started out being a bud tender, I was part time. I actually only worked in the dispensary one or two days a week in conjunction with what was my full time job um, in retail. I actually used to work for the Broncos, the Denver Broncos, for about six years um, and running their retail stores for about uh, two years, essentially. So I made the transition from conventional retail to cannabis uh, nice. back then in 2010, 2011 when um, there was a departure from the then GM and then the owners of that dispensary asked me, hey, can we pluck you from your, your Broncos job? And I thought it was the good move seeing as it was a, you know, an industry that was kind of its, in its infancy and you know, just starting to blow up at that point. So, Did so you have any apprehension about like moving from something that's so stable, like the Broncos versus <laughs> cannabis? <laughs> yeah. so, especially back then, it's like, who knew what, it, it, it was like, anybody could come in at any point and cut the legs out from underneath. Now the cat's too far out of the bag and everything, but right. yeah. yeah I, I think it would have been harder for somebody else who wasn't already assimilated into the culture. So I've always had, you know, an appreciation for cannabis since gosh, I was 15 or something, yeah. 16 and I'm 35 now. So 20 years. And so I took that leap of faith, you know, based off of a foundation of having a respect for the cannabis plant and, you know, having a, an interest in learning, you know, what different cannabinoids can do, you know, and what different terpenes can do and just learning all of the core facts that you really need to know about cannabis in order to kind of progress in this industry. So um, I think when you have a passion for what you're doing, it makes that decision much easier. Yeah. yeah, well very, said. Very, very well said. If you look at, at the differences between Colorado and Maryland, were you, I, I love the fact that Maggie Barge recruited you to come out here. Um, that, that, that's quite the, that, that is quite the ringing endorsement uh, of what, what you bring to the cannabis industry. Did you have reservations though about coming to a young, uh, undeveloped East Coast market? <laughs> that that's a loaded question. Um, All right. There's a lot to unpack in that question. Is lot, lot, lots to really take out the suitcase right there. But um, 
the the short answer is yes. I obviously did have my reservations. You know, I had to look at it from two different perspectives, right? I had to look at it from a personal perspective. You know, what was I gaining and losing from a personal um, level? And then from a career, right? You know, I was at that point, you know, we're talking three, four years ago and you're getting to that age where you really have to start thinking and being career minded, right? If you mm-hmm. really want to engulf yourself in an industry. And so kind of what I saw happening in the Denver market was this, you know, there's not a regression, but definitely a plateauing of kind of the revenue channel. You know, we were seeing kind of the same business month over month. The only real like major injection was when REC came around in 2014, right? And then, you know, that certainly served a pop for everybody. But, you know, the market (laughs) growth was not as significant, was becoming not as significant over the last couple of years. And so from a business perspective, you have to identify, okay, well, markets in their infancy are going to prove to have the most growth potential in the mm-hmm. beginning, right? You know, you go into a market that where nobody knows what they're doing and you either have the chance to make an immediate impact or you fall by the wayside. So I saw that as a challenge, right? In order to come into the market and say, hey, you know, with the experience that I have and with the hiring techniques that, you know, I've developed over the years, to say, hey, I think I can make, a, you know, have some really good traction in this marketplace, you know. Um, so I studied the legislation a little bit after Mackey initially contacted me. And, you know, Maryland, for the most part, has, has a really great system implemented. It looks like they've kind yeah. of taken the pros and the cons oh, from yeah. other states and yep. kind of, you know, done their homework in that respect. And so I really respected the work that was put into that from the MMCC level right? In saying, okay, this is how we're going to orchestrate workflow. You know, this is, you know, all of the essence of, you know, the compliance pieces behind it. So uh, as soon as I found an agreement with, you know, the legislation and all of those pieces, it made it progressively an easier decision for me. Wow. Wow. You know, you you bring up something that I think is so on the money. Maryland did, the way they, they looked at cannabis wasn't like this is a flash in the pan thing or this is a trend. It looked like everything they did was so forward thinking of saying that we're, we're going to bring this legitimate industry here. Uh, our, our co-founder, Mike, and I uh, check in on the Maryland market all the time and we see what they're doing with the, how many medical cards they issue per month and how everything is expanding. And it is nothing, uh, nothing short sort of impressive. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your, your day-to-day role uh, at Colton now. So it, we didn't cover that already. Chase, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do day-to-day at Colton. Sure. Um, so my role has kind of changed over. This is actually, I'm entering my third year at Colta officially three days from now. So it'll be three yeah. years and three Congrats, days. Congrats, my Happy man. Happy future anniversary. <laughs> well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, you know, and I've enjoyed every day of it here. My day-to-day role has kind of evolved over the last three years. Um, yeah. You know, back in 2018, it was very much more internal, um, you know, hiring process, you know, being a real GM at that point, you know, managing not only what we're going to do operationally, but who it's going to be, right, mm-hmm. that, that, that focuses on those operations and finding talent, right? And so from that point in April 2018, it's kind of developed into a much bigger uh, kind of entity, right? I mean, mm-hmm. back then, I think opening day, it was myself, our assistant manager, who's now our store manager, Ryan, who I brought with me from Colorado, and two other individuals that opened the dispensary. So we had a staff of four on a wow. new day for the first week. And so all four of us worked every day for the first week yeah. um, until we were able to get more people on staff. But, wow. you know, that's kind of the beginning. Now what it's evolved into is, you know, we have a 20-person operation at our Key Highway Dispensary, you know, where we deal with so many more SKUs. We have wine SKU variety, you know, we're dealing with, you know, same amount of vendors, but now it's become an idea of how do we expand ourselves and increase our brand affinity and maintain our place within the cultural aspect of what the industry is, because that's a core constituent of our company's, you know, mantra is culture and you know, uh, in my opinion, there's a lot of other companies out there that kind of tend to put that a little bit by the wayside or put it, you know, second, third or fourth in their priority list. Mm -hmm. But um, that was one of the appeals to me 
from Colta was that they were so focused, hyper focused on culture and making sure that it was one of those, you know, core constituents of the entire company. So, you know, it's my role with that being said has evolved over the years to make sure that that becomes a more over encompassing part of everything. What What is the culture, Chase? And has it changed? Like, did you, did you come in and, and get handed like a culture package and being like, this is what we're trying to be? Or did you get to participate in shaping of like, listen, guys, this is what would work or here's how I think, like, are you, here's how we present the culture and, and, and set the culture or are you, here's how we define it and set it or some kind of mix of both? So that, that's a, that's an interesting question. I think that that comes back to the essence of being a startup company, right? We're not one of these big MSOs, right? That have already these existing resources that we can just kind of put into another, you know, new location and say, wash, rinse, repeat, right? At that moment in time, it was, you know, even the leadership team was a, you know, our leadership team currently is about 15 individuals right now. And back then it was only five or six. Mm -hmm. So because of the lack of, you know, resources at that point, they kind of just handed it to me and said, get it going, you know, and and kind of establish, read the marketplace, you know, get into, you know, the culture and understand, you know, what is popular in the marketplace? What are people shopping for? Um, I think, again, back in 2018, it was kind of a free for all for everybody. Yeah. This is general race to understanding your typical, uh, your target market, right? And identifying who everybody's target market was. So I think that was what I had to do initially in the beginning to make sure that we could have, you know, return patients and, and build a foundation on what is that culture. So when we define what the culture is, it's, you know, some would say it's, it's about maintaining a relationship with the plant, right? Whether that be, you know, a cultivation relationship, a consumption relationship, a processing relationship. I think that um, some would argue that you have to have a relationship with the plant in order to understand the foundation of what is the cannabis culture, right? Um, You see that kind of argument built up in a lot of other markets where the consumer is worried about, you know, the company bringing in, you know, heads from other industries that aren't cannabis related, you know, and I don't necessarily think that is so much of a worry in so far as much as, uh, as maintaining just a, just an eye on the culture, right? I mean, we bring in, you know, we recently brought in Allison Siegel, she's a great individual, she's our new COO, and she actually came to us from Next Day Blinds, right, which is a, a blinds company, right? Wow. Some would argue that there's a, there's a detriment there, but I think that when you combine culture with typical business acumen, right, you're able to kind of, you know, I guess, uh, reside in a space where you have the best of both worlds, right? The taboo is that people who consume cannabis don't know what they're talking about. You can't take them seriously, right? And so it forces us to kind of have a more heightened, uh, you know, intelligent outlook over what we say and our opinions and our views and such. So, um, you know, culture is really important to maintain, but I think that there's also a subset of that in making sure that people don't overshadow you because you are part of that culture. That yes. Yeah. Yes. Very well said for sure. So, yeah, I think that's, that's where culture starts, right? Is just understanding the consumer and understanding what's, why people buy what they buy. And that's what Absolutely. it is. Just, and you can't have that, like you said, without the relationship to the plant and the things that you studied, like what do the cannabinoids do? What do the terpenes do? What like we've, that's all part and feeding into the relationship of the plant that dictates how you're going to sell and the culture you're going to establish and how to get new people in and stuff, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, uh, again, an over-encompassing an over, or an overarching statement is really that you got to have at least some people in your leadership team that have that relationship with the plant. Not everybody has to have it in order to have a successful company, but it's very important to have at least a core constituent of your, you know, uh, employees to be able to understand that, right? Totally. Yep. It, it's one of the, the things that, that I, I'm such an admirer uh, of what you, of the work that you guys do. And I wanted to bring this up with you, Chase, because I, I remember I was at a, a a learning um, a session out at MJ Biz at the, mm-hmm. at the trade show in Las Vegas. And I was in there with, with Bethany Gomez from the Brightfield Group. And they do a lot of work monitoring, of course, you know, uh, with CBD and, and the cannabis market. 
Um, I remember her saying, you know, about, you know, all these people that we just expected to jump into the cannabis business with no real backing and no real understanding or knowledge. She said, well, and it always stick out in my mind. She said, well, what are you bringing to the market that is unique? Are you just, are you just opening another storefront or are you just selling the next tincture? What are you doing that's going to make you stand out? Now, Cultus stands out. You guys really recreated this thing. You, you, uh, coming out as a lifestyle brand, that is so forward thinking. Um, and, and the things that distinguish Colter really blow me away. Uh, things like how, you know, your concept is really being part of a community. Mm-hmm. And, and that, there's a concentrated effort among all you to keep that going, is there not? Oh, yes, absolutely. I, absolutely. I mean, 100%. That all ties back to the culture, you know, piece. Um, I think that a key differentiator of ours in the marketplace is, again, that relationship with culture, you know, a lot of, even from a sales perspective, right? If you're signed up to these, you know, text threads or, you know, from all these dispensaries when they shoot out their daily deals or their blogs or so on and so forth, a lot of the content, um, at least that I experience or see from other places is very business centric, right? And it's Uh very like, you know, molded around, you know, what is going to benefit the bottom line the most, right? Like there's a saying out there that's, it's called patience over profit, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you look at and you gauge, you know, some of our competitors um, and their practices and their marketing habits, it's kind of, they don't encompass that lifestyle branding, right? It's more so just about the business. Here is our logo and here is what we provide, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think our team has done a very good job in providing, again, like you alluded to, that lifestyle perspective, right? We have a clothing line, you know, we have a blog on our website, you know, that that show that shows sentiments from staff members. We highlight members of our staff and showcase yeah. what they do for the industry and how they pertain to the core, you know, or how they are a core constituent of our being and, you know, our company and so on and so forth. And so I think it's important to be a people-centric operation as opposed to, you know, it's always got to be people first. Cannabis is a 1A, but people got to be the number one, right? I love the subtext, or at least I'm getting subtext from being a lifestyle brand like Colta is. It's also saying incorp- cannabis is a lifestyle product. It's, it's a product that you incorporate into your existing lifestyle. It doesn't change or alter or have to define in any stereotypical way. It's, it's an ingredient in your life to improve your life, just like better clothes or better service or better whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that there's an interesting kind of subliminal message going on with that when, with the way the cult runs. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that a lot of that is going to come with market maturity, right? Yeah. You know, back in 2018, nobody knew what they were doing out here. You know? <laughs> um, people were like, how do I even shop for this? You know, yeah. like, yeah. And our patient coordinators were acting much more as, you know, um, as liaisons, you know, as people who recommend, like doctors almost, you know. And we are, Mm -hmm. one thing that we tell our patients is that we are not doctors, right? We are merely conduits of information and expertise where we can recommend you what we believe is going to be the best product to, you know, uh, for whatever your ailment is, right? Whether it's anxiety, MS, what have you. Um, But I think that, you know, from that point, now the market's at a point where people know how to shop, right? And people know what they're going for. And the speed of transaction has lessened because people now are starting to understand what to focus on. It's not just high THC, right? People want to learn about terpenes. People want to learn about, you know, what's what's beta caryophyllene going to do for me um, as opposed to alpha pinene, right? Mm -hmm. And really starting to dig into the specifics. So, I think that is going to clear itself up, like I said, as the market matures with, you know, that, uh, that intelligence piece. Wow. Now, it, being so focused and in touch with culture and with people, as you are and as Colta um, is, I was looking at some of the stuff you guys used to do, uh, but, you know, and you do stand out as Colty with your own grow operation, your, uh, your, your lifestyle brand. And I was looking at you used to host events and partner with, with people doing musical events and things like that. Now, of course, all that has been ground to a halt. Uh, and, and the next thing I wanted to ask you, Chase, was take us into um, late March, early April 2020. Mm-hmm. Cannabis changes. Uh, it is now we're transitioning into an essential business. Now, 
did you get much sleep that first week or two? <laughs> you, you know the emoji where the guy's head is blown up? That was me. And I think, uh, I think the exact date for me was March 17th. And I only remember that because it was a day before my, my parents' birthdays are in March. And it was a day before my mom's birthday. And concurrently, while I'm thinking about what the hell am I going to get my mom for a birthday? I'm like, what the heck am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and so existential you know, dread just comes in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, it's, it's the little things, right? Uh, <laughs> but um, to, you know, to answer your question, that day was, was a huge pivot point for us. Um, you know, I spoke, we had a team meeting internally. I had a, uh, group meeting with my staff in the dispensary, called everybody in after close one day and said, hey, you know, being people focused, right? And said, hey, you know, there's no mandates right now. Mm -hmm. What are we all comfortable with doing and executing as a group? Because I'm not the type of individual to say, hey, people are still gonna shop, let's stay open all hours. I wanna make sure that my staff is comfortable, right? I wanna make right. sure that the people that are interacting with the patients, I mean, are, those are the people on the front lines and those are the people that we really have to focus on in the dispensary, right? I mean, those are our key individuals there. So we had this meeting and we said, well, what are we going to do? Well, we had a couple different options. One, we could still let people in the doors, which, pro you know, provided its own, you know, health risks at that point, right? Two, we could move to a hybrid model, which, which encompasses curbside and people coming in. Or three, we could go to curbside only. And I'm happy to have been one of the very first dispensaries to actually pivot to a curbside only model out of, you know, safety concerns, right? So in about 48 hours, um, me and the management team developed this curbside workflow, right? And it took, it took a little bit to get it, you know, good to go, 100% efficient. Yeah, um, yeah. The first couple of days were a little rough to say the least, but um, I think it took us about five or seven days to really you know, get the wheels turning, understand what we needed to do to develop the most efficient workflow for it to work. Wow. And I mean, in doing all that in a, in a pinch like that, that that's remarkable. Francesca, this is probably around that same timeline. Is this when you I was Chase... just going to say, yeah, yeah, cannabis being essential in COVID brought us back together, essentially. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's when we, we really came together and Mackie reached out and because we had been in touch before really early on when we were starting, when Mackie was starting about could we do sales for Culta and... Um, and he reached out and he was like, I, I think there's something here. Talk to Chase. And so that's when we, we got together and figured out that we could be part of the remote model with the cookies drops in particular and helping to alleviate some of those issues or hiccups or slow points or bottlenecks, whatever you want to call it, for your bud tenders mm -hmm. so that we can just do all the, the grunt work of answering phones, setting appointments, checking people out, and hopefully helping them with problems so that things can move a lot faster in the store. Anything you didn't need to be in the store to do, we wanted to take on to help. And, um, and it's been so great. Obviously, it worked out well. He's, Chase is here. So. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. We, uh, we could not have survived without their help. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, integral to the operation for sure. Thank yeah, we, you. We, yeah, yeah. we were like a, a group of, of little Wayne Gretzky's up here in the Northeast, just trying to provide assist after assist after assist. <laughs> and, and it was, Chase, I got I to gotta ask you a couple things about these days. So one of the unique things for our listeners is you, you guys have uh, this, this unique position where you, you with lights, licensing and, and mm -hmm. access to this, these incredible genetics, we, we come on and we're doing some support on these cookies drop days. Mm -hmm. Chase, I've never seen anything like it. I've oh, never yeah? seen any. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Chase, when are you guys open? 10 o'clock, we'd be on the computer at 9.58. You have no orders. 10.01, you have 325 orders and mm -hmm. going and going and going. Yeah, and that's not even the worst day. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it, that is a phenomenon. Uh, and, and what a special thing for Colta to be part of, to, have, uh, to be in that position, to, to have cookies in your store and to host days like that. But man, it really tests the metal of well, you and your did, staff. How did that come about, Chase? Like, how did you get the licensing for cookies? I mean, obviously, without giving away any trade secrets or anything. <laughs> <laughs> of course. 
of course, you know, I, I have to give all of the credit to Mackie on that one. You know, um, when that, when those talks were first opening up, um, that was probably, I'd probably been in Baltimore for about two or three months at that point. So we're talking, you know, April, May, 2018. And Mackie calls me one day and he says, you know, what do you think about this? And I said, well, I think it's great. You know, um, it's, it's a brand that's already recognized from, you know, what they call the legacy, right? The black mm -hmm. market, right? Yeah. Um, and it already has its kind of own legs that it stands on, you know, in that, you know, from a brand affinity and, you know, exposure and peace, right? Yeah. So I felt it was a good fit for us in that, in that realm. But also, you know, I told to Mackie was, listen, you know, we know the quality of our flower. Right. We knew that, you know, we have an experienced team of growers with Jay and his team and a, and a hell of a processing team with Michelle and all of them to to actually, you know, set our place in the Maryland market as a premium luxury, you know, brand, essentially. So Mackie and I kind of agreed, along with everybody else that he made the decision with that this would help validate, you know, what we can do with premium genetics, right? So to people who may only know cookies, right? Well, now suddenly the average consumer that wants cookies know that cookies is grown by Colta, right? Mm -hmm. And now they, they'll try, you know, some of our premium strains and understand that those are grown with the same passion and care as, you know, Gary Payton or Cereal mm -hmm. Milk or any of those, you know, popular cookies brands. So again, credit, all credit goes to Mackie on that one for, you know, getting the relationship going with them, you know, again, from the beginning, I thought it was a good move. And we're just very lucky to be working with them and all of our other partners as well. I want to hit just what you said, because I think it's important. I want to make sure people understand what you did here on, in terms of a business end and just in general. If, if I'm a patient and I'm walking into Colta and you, and I find out that you have cookies, I have more than one reason to go to Colta, not just because of a single line of product. Cause I want that one singular thing, which you do see a lot of, I'm sure these diehard brand loyalists, but the fact that you took the licensing of that or the, I guess, responsibility and honor and all of, and privilege of having access to that kind of genetics and then used it and said, guess what? We're good enough to grow cookies. Then you can, we're good enough to grow other stuff. That's just as high caliber. So there are mo you, you took it as um, almost a platform to elevate the cult of brand and saying like, this is the quality we're at. We're at cookies quality people. Yes, you can get cookies and you can get all this other stuff. That's going to meet the same kind of caliber. Absolutely. Um, I think that it was a challenge that we took on willingly, right? Yeah. We knew that we could succeed in that and that that would cement us in the marketplace as, you know, one of those premium providers. Um, and even furthermore, you know, you look at other markets where cookies exist, right? Obviously, they're originally from California, but they're in the Colorado market. You know, they're in the Michigan market. They're in the they're Arizona market. Now. Yeah. They're in Maryland mm -hmm. through us, you know, and, uh, mm. you know, cookies handpicks their partners, right? They go in and they do their research to make sure that they're working with prime cultivators. And, you know, with my position, I've been able to you know, experience Maryland cookies, go back home to Colorado, experience Colorado cookies, you know, experience California cookies on a trip with Mackie out to meet the cookies team, you know, so on and so forth. And just even from my personal experience, um, you know, I can say that, you know, we're definitely doing our brand and their brand a, a very good service in comparison to a lot of the other marketplaces as well. So not to toot our own horn here, but why not? You know, <laughs> why, not? why not? So um, but yeah, like you said, Francesca, I think uh, it was a challenge that we willingly undertook, um, understanding what the benefits could be, um, you know, for our own product line and catalog. Yeah, it's, it's well done. Very yeah. well done. I mean, yeah, take a much deserved bow. I looked into <laughs> that, that um, the deal, like when you take on cookies, it's not just, oh yeah, we have cookies. They, they're really top to bottom. A, a great profile uh, in last December on Burner when I was reading it talking about they check in on you they check in on your grow they check in on your social media it's like you're you're carrying us but you better you know we'll love up, we'll love up to certain expectations and you're expected to do so as well two very forward thinking companies man and again take a bow so we're talking about um the the, the future now cult is about to turn six that's that's remarkable again in the cannabis business if you're around more than two years man again 
take a well, bow. Especially East Coast. <laughs> you know, East, East Coast is an immature market as of yet. Right. And so you guys get to stand out as like an, a little bit of um, the – an original, you know, mm -hmm. so that's, that's really impressive. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I know that we pride ourselves on is being, you know, a Maryland bred company, right? You know, mm -hmm. Mackie, he's from Maryland, you know, he grew up here. Um, and, you know, with his connections in the industry, right, you know, obviously, he always just wanted to recruit the best, right, so that we could supply the best to the marketplace. And being a unique Maryland bred company that's completely vertically integrated, I think was also, you know, seen as kind of a, a, a good point as well for us, you know, um, there's not, I mean, if you look at the entire marketplace, you know, it's a limited license market, right? So, you know, there's only 16, 17 cultivators, same amount of processors, 92 dispensaries. And if you look at the wholesale channels from the sales perspective and you just focus in on the cultivators and the processors, you know, you're looking at half of those 34, 35 companies being from out of state, you know, or being derivatives of MSOs or being originally standalone companies that have since been bought out by MSOs. So progressively as the, you know, uh, market and industry matures, the essence of a pure Maryland bred company is going to decline and wane, you know, um, you know, with all of this major consolidation that potentially could happen as it does in markets. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, that's just general business right there. So yeah, we definitely pride ourselves on being a Maryland bred company. So if I'm, so if I'm a Maryland medical patient, I want to go into Culta for m way more than one reason, obviously, <laughs> like you're, you know what you're doing, you grow the best, you're a lifestyle brand, you put people first, you are truly an Amer a Maryland organization. Is there anything else to it that's like, if I'm picking a dispensary, why, why, is there anything we haven't covered of why Culta, why pick Culta? As well, you know, I think that's a, that, that hits pretty much all the targets, right? Those are big uh, ones. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, you know, we definitely, the one major thing that we want to convey to the patient is that we have a passion for, for the product, right? And a passion to assist, right? And a passion to help these patients out with whatever they're looking for, um, whether it be cookies, whether it mm -hmm. be, you know, a specific strain for their ailment, whether it be for the recommendation on the best gummy, right? Um, I think that passion is, is a huge key word in our operation. So, but I think you touched on everything that we try to do to set ourselves apart. Yeah. What, what is it that patients can do when they're coming in to, I guess, prepare themselves for having a really good visit? Is there anything that they should, I guess, do or be ready or ask questions? Is there anything that the patient can do to have a better, a better experience in Culta? You know, if there's anything that I've experienced over, you know, my tenure um, in dealing with patients, it's that the reservation of chatting about cannabis is now starting to wane and dissipate, right? Good. And the biggest, you know, piece that I could suggest to any new patient is don't be scared. You know, these, you know, no matter what dispensary you go to, whether it's ours, which I hope you come to, or anybody else's in the marketplace, you know, um, a lot of, you know, the other key players in the industry, they have, they, they've got great help behind the desk. And all of these patient coordinators, whether in my shop, anywhere else in the industry, they're really just out to help people. And, you know, up, if we can kind of chip away at the, the taboo, right, uh, of, yes. of chatting yeah. about this and start to normalize it, right, and again, bringing it into our culture, right? Yes. That's why culture is a big part, because that's going to help normalize, uh, you know, cannabis discussion and, you know, all of that good stuff. So, um, yeah, I would just recommend everybody to, you know, not be scared, understand that people are there to help. And there is no question that your bud tender has not heard or comment that your bud tender has not heard before. I guarantee you. So um, take that in stride. Yeah, we're, we're all working to undo the, the, the damage that was done by so many bad grade school uh, films that we saw. And, and we can talk about cannabis freely. We can- The reefer we, madness. That's yes. right. The reefer <laughs> madness in 1936. We're still right. dealing with the damages of that one. Yep. And look, I, I, I speak to bud tenders uh, who, don't, who don't work at Colta. They're all, they all want to. They all are kind of in awe of what the operation you have going on. 
Uh, and, and again, it's, it's something that is just, just exceptional. And it's a big reason why we're so honored to have you with us today. I want to get this to you uh, before we, we wrap up here, Chase. Real quick, give us your thoughts on, on the future, not just the future for Colta, and, and tell us about any plans you guys have in the works, uh, if you're you know, staying put or expanding. But that Maryland market has to give you a, a huge sense of optimism. If people don't know, in your first year, uh, of of being in a, a medical program, you guys topped a hundred million dollars in that very first year. It lo- the future certainly looks bright for Maryland. We know how many uh, medical cards they process per month, uh, but it, the future's looking good for Colta as well. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think for the market as a whole, you know, if we look generally on the market, and I kind of think about you know what's going to happen, um, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, you know. The MMC releases data, you know, every month about sales in the marketplace and all that good stuff every month. And when you look at 2020, for example, you could see a significant sales almost doubled. I think it was like one point, it was like one in three between February and December. I think February was, I know December was four, it was like 450 million in the marketplace. And I think back in February, it was like 275. Don't quote me on this stuff. Go look it up yourselves, guys. But I know that December was right around that 440 mark. And so you could kind of see the growth and revenue in the marketplace. And when you look at it from a patient perspective, right, and analyze whether, you know, the same volume of patients are signing up month to month you still see it traveling upwards. You kind of see it a little bit tapering off, but it's still going up. Instead of like this, it's like this. Yeah. (laughs) Um, With those two factors being said, I think that Maryland's market still has plenty of growth, you know, to, to, to undertake, you know, they say that a rough estimate of the pop of total population um, that should have medical cards in a mature market is about 2%. There's 6 million people in Maryland and 2%, I mean, 1% there is 60,000. So 2% is 120,000. We have like 130,000 patients in Maryland. So we're above that 2% mark, right? And we're still climbing, right? Nice. So um, I think that there is, uh, you know, huge potential for Maryland's marketplace. And I think that a lot of bigger players are seeing that. And it comes back to the consolidation piece mm-hmm. before, um, you know, being in a limited license marketplace, you have to make business decisions with that in mind, right? Um, you know, it's not like a Colorado marketplace or even worse, an Oregon, right, marketplace where there's, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of licenses and there's this oversaturation in the marketplace, right? Um, you know, we're trying to find a good medium um, as far as flower supply is concerned amongst the entire industry. And I think we've kind of with people that have grown and added on grow space and all of that stuff. I think we've kind of caught up with the marketplace as far as from a demand level. Um, a year or two from now, you obviously think about rec, right? Mm-hmm. And, and about whether that's going to come along. Um, you know, there's different stuff in the news every single day, right? Sure about is. rec and somebody talking about a bill and, you know, pushing a bill forward and somebody else supports this bill and whatever, what have you. Um, it's not an if anymore. It's a when. Right. And then when that does happen, that is going to, you know, just like it did in Colorado, create again, this is just me speaking from opinion, right? Um, a market shift, right? Mm-hmm. You know, where now suddenly the market is driven by, you know, you'll see prices probably go up because of excise taxes that are going to be imposed because of rec, all that good stuff. But depending upon how quick Maryland, uh, you know, is to the, in the race, right? Um, We could start to, you know, see people from surrounding states start to come in, right? As long as we're an early adopter of these rec practices, right? Um, If we're late to the game, it doesn't benefit Maryland as much because every state has their own unique market and it's already, you know, squashed at that point. But um, I do think rec is something you obvious is a monster you have to consider in the next two years. Um, And then understand that some of these MSOs are, looking at it that way too and you know potentially big players that want to come in will come in and you know we have to prepare for that so absolutely very cool yeah chase thank you thank you so much now i do have uh, a couple real serious questions very (laughs) uh very dead dead serious i ask them at the end of the show uh, 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 you know every time to make sure we end on a downer no (laughs) i always do we always talk about pets you a lot no um (laughs) We did some research on you. 
Uh, I got some research here. Oh, oh, you did research on me. Okay. <laughs> Chase. Oh God, now, here I, we go. I, I hear, I hear you're a big sneaker guy. I am a big, uh, it's yeah, it's, I'm a big sneaker guy. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's a cookies drop. It's coming up. It's a big one. Yep. You guys are undoing it. You're going to be on your feet all day. What pair of shoes do you go to for that all day comfort? Depends on what I'm wearing for a sweatshirt or a t-shirt. I'm a big color coordinator. So I, <laughs> let's say I you're rocking about, that, that blue Adidas right there. I, I, you, oh, nice. <laughs> so nice. just took it off my foot. So I <laughs> like it. You don't get any more honest than that. That's like real time. No, <laughs> if you're right there, um, if you're listening, Chase just showed, showed it off. Yeah, go ahead, Chase. <laughs> Jordan one Royals in hand. These are my, these are my everyday guys, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Jordan one guy. That's my favorite shoe. I probably own about 20, 25 pairs of those in different colors. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I'll typically wear, wear one of those. Yeah. That's, that's a comfortable shoe and it is, it is a veritable work of art in my opinion. Classic. Uh, you can only wear, Francesca, I'll start with you. You could wear one brand of sneaker the rest of your life. What are you oh, going God. with? I'm What's the most so comfortable everyday sneaker? Whatever the opposite of what Chase is. It's like I have what? one. I buy one pair of sneakers, and if they work, I just keep buying them until they're discontinued because I can't yeah, yeah, yeah. stand shoe shopping. I hate it. <sighs> so uh, right currently, it's this Adidas sneaker. It's basic. It was on sale in Kohl's. That's the kind of <laughs> cutting edge revelation that we have here on Infused. Not Adidas, <laughs> Adidas, comma sneakers. Oh yeah. Um, that's the one. Chase, do you have a, a favorite brand, or is it the Jordans? Because you're there, you're every day. Um, I mean, Jordan ones will always have my heart. But if we're talking about the most comfortable shoe that I'm aware of, um, I have to go with the Adidas Ultra Boost. Um, they're not the best for winter because they have like the mesh upper, but um, their soles, they have um, this material called boost, right? And it's, it's very spongy. It's, it like reacts to your, your body weight and uh, it's very, very great. It feels like you're walking on clouds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Now I got to, as soon as we're done this, I got to go check those out. <laughs> I got to go check those out. Hey, I've been Jesus, wearing- Pay me. I've been... <laughs> Adidas is going to get in touch with Chase right after this. <laughs> I'm rocking Adidas here too. So, yeah. you know, I still, I still rock the same pair of Lanzara Jackal indoor soccer shoes. I think I've had them for eight years. They're, they're barely hanging on. Uh, it's probably time for duct tape to come along. Francesca wouldn't be seen with me if, if, that, if we go into that thing. I have now, my, I'm not a sneaker person, but I do have my limits. And, there you go. And, and now fi and finally, I'm going to rip one from the headlines. I'm just going to ask your opinion. And a, would you rather... Francesca and Chase. Uh, aliens have arrived. Francesca, would you rather they be robotic aliens or organic aliens? Ooh. I think organic. I find them more interesting. You have a lot more, um, I think you have a harder time to figure out if they're friend or foe and what could happen, but that's what makes it fun. I guess about an alien invasion. <laughs> After the past year, man, bring it on. We got it. <laughs> Let's see what they got. <laughs> All right. Chase, how about you? Do you want these, these aliens to be organic or robotic? Uh, you know, if it's me, I'm thinking, all right, well, I'm going to be a little freaked out encountering an alien first off. And if they're robotic, I'm probably going to be intimidated. So I would probably prefer organic just because I feel like it would break the ice. It would make the ice break a little bit easier and be like, Hey, what's up guys? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of and like, Oh, you move and you sound like the Terminator. Um, you know, I'll, yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. I, I do too. I think that plus they might grow their own strains. We might have intergalactic ganja <laughs> that we could sample from these organic things. And the, the robot ones, I automatically just think we'd be, we'd be, getting in a fight with him real quick, especially on the Northeast. We're not going to deal with that shit. Uh, it's they, they gritty after him. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, look, I, I mean this in the very, uh, I mean these words sincerely, uh, Chase. You said earlier that, you know, Mackey's whole thing, Mackey Barch is, is uh, committed to recruit the best. He obviously did that with you, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your, your wisdom and experience and just for being an all around great guy. We really appreciate you being on with us today. 
Thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure, and I loved chatting with you guys. And let me know if you guys want me on again. Oh, Always. Now, now we'll see you next time coming around, my friend. Uh, this has been Infused. Francesca, say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Chase. Always, always a pleasure talking with you. We'll see you next. We'll see you next time from Delaware. Delaware. Bye, bye, guys. Bye.